This video is brought to you by World of Tanks, a free-to-play historical action game. Get started today with 7 premium days, 500 gold, and the premium tank, the T-127. Link below. More on them in a bit. Imagine a grim February night in the year 1919. You and a friend have traveled to the Pigalle district of Paris and have come to the end of a narrow, dimly lit cul-de-sac. It's the type of place that seems built for a murderer's ambush. The room you enter is small. The ambience is suffocating. You find yourself sweaty and dizzy, heaving for a breath of clean air. And yet, you can't leave. You can't run outside to the welcome lashes of freezing wind. Just a few feet away is a gaunt pale man, brandishing his tools as a priest would with his crucifix. He is standing over a slight woman tied to the bed, surrendered to her fate. As the first splash of red fluid splashes and obscures your vision, you can only perceive your companion dropping to the floor in the corner of your periphery vision. Torture is unfolding in front of your very eyes, but no bystanders intervene. Some scream and some rush outside gagging. Others have simply fainted. A voice shouts for a doctor, but perhaps it's too late for that. Maybe a mortician instead. As the lights go off, you can finally exhale. But how are you going to drag your unconscious friend to the Chez Polidor later for drinks and oysters? Before that, you must congratulate the killer and his victim on their finest performance in months. The premiere of this new drama was brilliant. At least seven people fainted and five spectators rushed outside before the end. There were three separate complaints to management about how gruesome the show was. But that's not bad for a debut at the Grand Guignol, the theater of horrors in the heart of Paris. From 1897 until its closure in 1962, the Grand Guignol Theatre became a legendary foundation of Parisian culture, from the Belle Epoque to the early steps of counterculture. The speciality of the house was a selection of short plays centered around themes of violence, mental disorders, crime, revenge, and explicit graphic torture. These plays were a shocking catalogue of stories conceived to shock audiences to the core of their morals and their digestive systems. It was a relentless, revolutionary assault on the conventions of bourgeois drama and its values. It is not unsurprising, then, that the Grand Guignol could count a handful of future revolutionary leaders among its fans. Ho Chi Minh, who worked in Paris as a pastry chef in his youth, enjoyed the theatre's work. So too did the nonconformist writer Anais Nin. Regular spectators also included members of the establishments like King Carol of Romania. But let me take it from the start. The venue, later known as the Theatre de Grand Guignol, was originally a chapel built in the 18th century as part of a convent. This incarnation was short-lived as the French Revolution came along and the convent was assaulted by anti-clerical mobs during the 1791 Reign of Terror. The chapel was thoroughly sacked, gutted, and converted for other purposes. For a while, it became a blacksmith's workshop. When Parisians tempered their animosity toward organized religion, it became a church again, but not for long. Sometime in the first half of the 19th century, the building was recorded as an artist's studio, and finally it was converted into a theater. First, it was known as the Théâtre Salon, purveyor of a more wholesome brand of entertainment, before being rebranded as the Théâtre du Grand Guignol in 1897. The manager, Oscar Metinier, had somewhat lofty ambitions for his theatre. The name roughly translates as Big Puppet, a reference to a popular style of puppet show of the time with strong political and satirical undertones. A blend of political commentary and social realism were center stage in Oscar's plans. The first show to premiere at the Grand Guignol was Mademoiselle Fifi by literary master Guy de Maupassant. Based on his short story, this was a realistic tale about the Prussian occupation during the War of 1870. The following chores were equally great grounded in reality, gradually moving towards the exploration of working-class issues. Metinier had received considerable attention for his productions, which defied censorship and dared to focus on the undesirables of society, like prostitutes or criminals. However, by 1898, he was already bucking under the pressure of keeping the theatre solidly relevant night after night. Eventually, Metinier decided to relinquish control of his theatre to a new owner, Max Maury. It was the 
world director who shaped the Grand Guignol into the house of horrors that became recognized the world over. Maury was an outsider in the world of theatre, with little artistic background to speak of, but Max had two invaluable talents, a shrewd sense of showmanship and a knack for making loads of money. Through these talents, he understood that times were ripe for material that pushed the boundaries of what was acceptable. He wanted his new theatre to focus on terror. Maury continued the tradition of focusing on the underworld, but he abandoned the social realist aspect and placed his bets on the sensationalist aspect. His plays overemphasized gore, shock, and scandal. According to legend, Maury would measure the success of a play by the number of fainting patrons. As an inspired PR stunt, he even hired a doctor to treat audience members who were overwhelmed by shock and disgust. The publicity was effective, but what really attracted the Parisian crowds were the plays which Maury selected, edited, and curated for the Grand Guignol. Max adopted a double feature approach for each evening, featuring two short plays, one horrific and gory, the other a bawdy comedy. This is system of hot and cold showers cemented the theatre's reputation as both a house of horror and a house of loose morals. Sounds kinda like a good evening. As the Grand Guignol grew in popularity, it attracted the attention of celebrity playwrights, even Gaston Leroux, author of The Phantom of the Opera, who wanted a guest spot. But the star writer and chief partner in crime for Maury was André Delord, the Prince of Terror, who penned over 100 plays between 1901 and 1926. Delord had been obsessed with death since his childhood and often enlisted his psychiatrist Alfred Binet as his co-writer. Their partnership produced some of the most controversial or Guignol plays ever staged. For instance, the pair wrote The System of Dr. Gaudron and Professor Feather, an Edgar Allan Poe adaptation about an asylum taken over by the criminally insane. There was also The Man of the Night, a disturbing tale of necrophilia based on the real crimes of Sergeant Francois Bertrand, the vampire of Montparnasse. After 16 successful years, Max Maury went into a well-deserved early retirement, having made The Growing Guignol one of the biggest attractions in Paris. And just before we get into the rest of the history of the theater, I just want to take a moment to tell you about today's sponsor, World of Tanks. World of Tanks is a free-to-play historical action game with a huge tank arsenal to choose from. Tank destroyers, artillery, light, medium, or heavy tanks, there's a lot to choose from. And you can play exactly as you want to. Maybe you want to rush in. Maybe you want to set a trap. Maybe you want to take people out from a distance, like some sort of tank sniper. In World of Tanks, you take part in massive battles in a wide range of different environments, from deserts to industrial zones and everything in between. It's all in there. It's also free to play, and in this game, skills win battles, not money. If you're a novice or a pro, you are going to have a good time with this game. Plus, there are a hundred million people playing this game. So yes, World of Tanks is where history meets action, and if you get started with our link below, you will get seven premium days, 500 gold, and a premium tank, the T127 for free. Doing that also supports the show, and like I said, it's free, so why not? And let's get back to the video. The Grand Guignol was and is considered one of the most interesting performance venues in Europe, and not just because of the nature of its repertoire. A big part is played by the location and the very structure of the building. The theatre was located in Rue Chaptal, a cul-de-sac within the Pigalle district, under the shadow of Montmartre Hill. In the 19th century, both areas made for less than reputable postcodes associated with licentious spectacle and the sex industry. But Pigalle was also teeming with ateliers and workshops where the lowest strata of Parisian society mingled with artists who fully embraced a bohemian lifestyle. Pigalle was also a district of dimly lit alleys and coffee houses where radical thought proliferated. It is not a coincidence that the 1871 Paris Commune insurrection started in this area. Directors of the Grand Guignol in the late 19th and early 20th centuries used the location to their advantage. Even before the show started, spectators would be fully immersed in an ambience of slight unease fostered by the unusual but exciting surroundings. 
The venue, the building itself, played a great part too. There are scant records and images of what the Grand Guignol used to look like, but we are reasonably sure that its interior, a deconsecrated chapel, still maintains a religious-like vibe. Up to the 1950s, patrons were overwhelmed by the smell of candle wax and incense impregnating the walls. A regular spectator at the time, Madame Pesch, wrote, Inside there was a certain atmosphere and smell. Being an old chapel, maybe the smell was incense, or maybe wax, I don't know. It felt like plunging into a tomb. But the point was, it created a spooky atmosphere. If spectators looked around the auditorium before the lights went out, they could appreciate fine murals with a religious theme. If, after the show had started, they lifted their eyes to the rafters, they would meet the blank stare of two giant carved angels glaring in the limelight. The already unsettled audience may have noticed that these angels appeared to be weeping at times. This was not a result of a fiendish special effect, but simply because of poor maintenance. French actor and director Robert Hosson of Les Miserables Flame was a Grand Guignol performer in his youth, and he remembers that the rain sometimes leaked through the roof. The audience thought it was raining blood. Another distinctive feature of the auditorium was the 13 ground floor boxes. Normally, theater boxes are designed to allow for a small party of spectators to have some privacy while they enjoy the show. In this case, the privacy aspect was turned up to 11. These boxes appeared to be repurposed confessional booths, typical of a Catholic chapel. In other words, they were enclosed in wooden panels and grills. These allowed for spectators to watch the show without being seen. Accounts of the early decades of the Grand Guignol mention that sometimes patrons inside these boxes would get uh, busy. Indeed, sometimes this business was loud enough to prompt actors to interrupt performances with a cry of, have you finished yet? This most amusing anecdote illustrates another important ingredient of the Grand Guignol's success, its sense of intimacy. The performance space had a small square 7x7 seven seven meter space at its center. That's 23 feet each side. The stage was faced by an auditorium of about 100 seats arranged in six rows. The auditorium was surrounded by three orders of stalls arranged in a semicircle, plus the 13 boxes I mentioned earlier. The theater could sit about 180 to 200 spectators, none of whom felt far from the performers. A theater critic wrote that the Grand Guignol was so cramped inside that a front row spectator could shake hands with the actors as he stretched his feet into the prompter's box. The diabolical playwrights and directors of the Grand Guignol exploited this sense of intimacy to bring about its deranged, inbred, locked-in-a-cellar cousin, claustrophobia. The limitations of the stage surface and the areas behind the wings severely restricted the action that could take place and the scale of locations that could be used. Most of the Grand Guignol plays were set inside cramped, encroaching environments, emphasizing a sense of dread and suffocation. Places like brothel bedrooms, opium dens, asylum cells, torture chambers, operating theaters, execution courtyards, etc. Max Mori was succeeded by business partners Camille Choisy and Charles Zabel. The latter was mainly concerned with the finances of the theater, leaving all artistic directions in Monsieur Choisy's hands. Camille had no previous experience in theater management, but he was a seasoned actor with an in-depth knowledge of stagecraft. During his tenure from 1914 to 1928, Choisy used this experience to push the Grand Guignol towards more elaborate staging and complex lighting rigs. Most importantly, he invested in special effects to simulate elaborate methods of torture and murder. During the Maury years, Grand Guignol actors were usually dispatched by sword, dagger, or strangulation. These killing methods appeared tame compared to the real-life horrors of the Great War, so Choisy cynically encouraged his writers to get creative when it came time to end a character's life. These poor sods would end up dissolved in acid, electrocuted, blown up into pieces, or even torn limb from limb and eaten by pumas. Whatever flicker of social realism may have been inherited from Oscar Martinez's run, it was completely gone by now. Unless, of course, pumas were a grand metaphor for unchecked capitalism. Maybe. Besides this untamed and joyous cavalcade of gore, the biggest factor to Choisy's success was the hiring of actress Paula Maxa 
in 1919. The woman who often went just by Maxa soon became known as the most assassinated woman in the world. Prior to Jamie Lee Curtis and her mother Janet Lee, Maxa was the original Scream Queen. She was reputedly killed on stage some 10 thousand times in at least 60 different ways. Over the course of her roles, she called for help exactly 983 times. She screamed, they are killing me, 1,263 times, and I'm being assaulted, precisely 1,804 and a half times. The period from 1919 to 1926, during which manager Choisy, actress Maxa, and playwright Delord were in force at the theatre together all at the same time, became known as the Golden Age of Guignol. A prime example of vintage Choisy, Maxa, Delord production was The Torture Garden of 1922, which is going to be our excuse to explore what kind of horrific violence took place on stage at the Grand Guignol and how it was simulated. The play, based on an erotic novel by decadent author Octave Mibot, opens like a spy story. French agent Jean Machal is traveling to China to undermine subversive activity. There, he becomes romantically involved with Clara, played by our leading lady Maxa. Clara is an English femme fatale who happens to be a spy, a double agent, and a violent, sadistic, bisexual predator who enjoys elaborate torture rituals. Also, long walks on the beach, swipe right. <laughs> Clara takes the reluctant Marshall to witness the forbidden pleasures of the torture garden. It's beautiful. I've seen prisoners hanged back in England, anarchists garroted in Spain, in Russia. I saw a group of soldiers flog a young girl to death. I've even seen a beautiful young woman fed to a lion in a cage. But nothing is as frightening, so terribly beautiful, as what they have here, the torture garden. Clara does not hide the effects of torture on her being. When I see the convicts being punished, I don't know what comes over me. I'm filled with such extraordinary desires. It goes so deep into my body that I would love you so intensely tonight. I would be so wild. By the way, at this point we should say, don't watch Geographics with your kids because, well, it gets worse. Clara makes a move on T-Bar, a local girl, but she rejects her advances. The femme fatale orders lead torturer T-Mao to punish her by slowly peeling away a long strip of skin just as you would peel a piece of fruit. This is how the punishment was simulated on stage. Before the actress playing to bar walked on stage, makeup artists affixed a long, thin strip of adhesive plaster at the level of the actress's shoulder blades. The strip was dyed red on the bottom and flesh color on top. On stage, one of the executioners pinned to bar on the ground. The actor playing to Mao then simulated making two slits in the girl's back using a prop knife. In reality, he had bloodied her back with fake blood contained in a small tube or vial, which he would then hide. When Tabar's back was exposed to the audience, Timao would then tear the plaster between the shoulder blades, revealing what appeared to be red raw flesh. At the end of the play, Tabar has her revenge by stabbing Clara's eyes with two hot needles. Slowly, very slowly, the curtain closes to the screams of the once torturer, who is now a victim. We don't have a record of how this trick was achieved, but we know about other special effects that involved eye gouging. In a typical scene, an attacker would appear to press a sharp object into the eye of a victim, while in fact he or she was squeezing a concealed bulb of red dye on the cheek of the actor. A moment later, the same victim would scoop up a clump of thick Vaseline and fake blood from under a table or other hiding place, slap it onto their cheek, and slowly drag it down the face with their finger. And what if the scene involved someone eating the freshly gouged eye? Well, no problem, as manager Choisy had special deals with confectioners in the area who would bake delicious deliciously sweet, edible eyes. By now, you may have realized that violence targeting the eyes was a grand guignol favorite. As suggested by authors Richard J. Hand and Michael Wilson, this may have been related to early psychoanalysis. As described by Sigmund Freud, a study of dreams and fantasies and myths has taught us that anxiety about one's eyes, the fear of going blind, is often enough a substitute for the dread of being castrated. In 1926, financial partner Charles Zibal sold his shares of the Grand Guignol to director Jack Chavin. Choisy and Chavin did not get along well, and in 1928, Camille left to manage another theatre. Chavin, quite the controlling type, also got rid of Maxa, as she was too popular and overshadowed the rest of the enterprise. Years later, the Scream Queen returned to Grand Guignol, but her popularity was waning. Apparently, years of blood-curdling screams had 
damaged her voice. Max's decline coincided with that of the theater as a whole. Some authors have placed the blame on Javin, accusing him of getting rid of most of the back catalog from the Golden Age. Javin, in fact, preferred content more focused on psychological and erotic menace rather than the old recipe of physical violence with a sprinkling of bawdy comedy and partial nudity. Max later stated that the decline was due to Javin's habit of micromanaging and multitasking, which led to bad decisions and inefficiency. But it would be unfair to place all of the blame on him. Javin's tenure coincided with the advent of the talkies and especially of early horror movies like James Whale's Frankenstein of 1931. Let's not forget that the times were changing, and they were changing a lot. After the trauma of World War I, Parisians had begun to recover some of the confidence and joie de vivre of the Belle Epoque in the 1920s. But by the following decade, the European stage was being darkened by the rise of dictatorial regimes, and sabers were rattling behind the wings. Audiences were perhaps less in the mood for an evening of deranged, mindless spectacle. Javin eventually quit his post in July of 1938, handing over the baton to Eva Berkson, an Englishwoman. Eva officially opened her residency in February of 1939, but in June of 1940 she ran into a slight mishap, the German invasion of France. Berkson had to flee to England, and the vacuum at the helm was filled by good old Camille Choisy, who re-enlisted Maxa and packed the program with Andre Delord's classics. The Grand Guignol recaptured some of its old popularity, especially amongst the occupation forces. Apparently, even Hermann Goering enjoyed the pleasures of degenerate art. And if I may say so, Mr. Tarantino, you may have missed a trick here. Shasana could have been a stage manager at the Grand Guignol rather than a cinema owner, and the theatre would have been a perfect setting for the final showdown of the bastards. But, well, I digress. After the war, Eva Berkson returned in 1946 to reclaim her theatre, but the Grand Guignol was on a sunset trajectory. Berkson fled to England again in 1952. This time, according to Maxa, she was not chased by panzers, but rather by debt collectors. The theatre was then managed by one Charles Nonon in partnership with actor, writer, and director Eddie Gillane. The two ferried the dying theatre into the 1960s, as well as the genre associated with it. Ghislaine's plays were celebrated by contemporary critics, but audience numbers are really what matter, and they were steadily hemorrhaging. In November of 1962, the curtain of the Grand Guignol closed for the final time over the agonizing screams of a tortured character. On the 5th of January 1963, a sale of all props and scenery drove the final wooden stake through the heart of Pigalle. There has been much debate as to why the Grand Guignol petered out of existence. Again, the times may have been to blame. Anasinin recalls that after the war and the concentration camps, what the theatre presented seemed to be laughable and infantile. Last manager Charles Nonon agreed when interviewed by Time magazine in November 1962. We could not compete with Buchenwald. This makes sense. However, the same audiences who were shocked by the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust would still go to the movies and watch horror films. It may have been the explosion in popularity of this medium and this genre that sealed the Grand Guignol's casket. The venue that once hosted the Grand Guignol is still there, now home to the International Visual Theatre, dedicated to performing plays in sign language. But what of the essence, the spirit, of the Grand Guignol. Theatre is, by definition, ephemeral and fleeting. A play may be published, performances may be photographed or even filmed, but none of these media can accurately render the real experience of being there, bearing witness to something exciting or terrifying happening on stage. However, some of the original magic of the Grand Guignol has been at least partially captured by the genre that killed it horror films. Since the late 1920s and early 1930s, several Grand Guignol plays were adapted for the screen, eventually influencing the aesthetic of cinematic terror. This tradition continues even today, with the likes of the Saw and Hostel franchises surely owing a large debt of gratitude to Delord and his colleagues. And if you are still looking for a stage experience, then several modern theatre troupes have revived the Grand Guignol repertoire, such as Molotov Theatre Group in Washington, D.C., or Thrill Peddlers in San Francisco. If you've been lucky enough to attend some of these plays, do let us know your impressions in the comments below, and I really do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do hit that like button below and support us by supporting our fantastic sponsor, World of Tanks, link below, and thank you for watching.